Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, yeah, uh, within the theme of uh, natural resource management, I'll be covering uh, a few themes on uh, a few topics such as indigenous knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge and also uh, how uh, the different worldview or so to say how is indigenous people's uh, notion of life project different from the dominant development discourse and also uh, we would be looking at uh, a case studies which is primarily conducted by me uh, among the Kuki tribes in Northeast India. So in that we will be trying to look at how uh, the ecological uh, knowledge are being formed and how it is being related with the cultural landscape. Now, uh, before uh, going into all those, it will be uh, vital for us to look at uh, the pretty uh, the notion of this indigenous knowledge, how it is being understood, and what are the concepts and meanings of how indigenous knowledge comes into being. Now, in this knowledge, uh, which is also uh, popularly known as IK means the knowledge or wisdom of the people those uh, who must be you know regarded as indigenous. Now uh, a question which normally arises is uh, can this indigenous knowledge be possessed by people who are uh, non-indigenous or, or people who belong to uh, a different uh, category. Now, uh, what is this notion of indigenous and who are indigenous people? Uh, according to the uh, ILO convention, it regarded the indigenous people as those communities who have been residing in a uh, particular geographical location or territory uh, much, much before the intervention of the colonists or how uh, before the coming of this colonialism. Now, uh, if such is the case, there are also people, uh, communities who have been uh, residing in a particular uh, geographical landscape, say for the past maybe 50 years, 100 years, so and so forth. So in that context, can we say that uh, this idea of uh, knowledge or traditional ecological knowledge uh, can be much more suited or relevant rather than using the term indigenous knowledge. Now, without delving much into the issue of what could perhaps be, you know, uh, a suitable term, and then over the the reason why I'm trying to make a clarification is here uh, because I, I'll be trying to use the IK and PEK uh, more, more or less as the same uh, thing and then uh, we, we, which will be used interchangeably all throughout the lecture. Now knowledge in a way uh, is regarded as uh, something which is inseparable and also pretty much embodied in their affinities with land. So this is some kind of attributes which when we try to look at knowledge in the context of the indigenous people. Now we all know like knowledge can be different type. It, it can be uh, formal, the written one which, which is documented. 
and and it, it can be a sort of knowledge which is normally you know uh, orally handed down from uh, for generations which is pretty much the case uh, generally among the the native or the indigenous people now their knowledge in a way is pretty much uh, uh, confined or embedded uh, in the uh, geographical landscape which they belong to so uh, in the process they are pretty much familiar with the biodiversity flora fauna and so on and so forth now I care the indigenous knowledge is also uh, pretty much oriented in a particular sociocultural setting in a given time by a community or a society. Now, by saying so, that is uh, in a particular context in a given time. Now, what if a particular uh, sociocultural community? is being displaced from their original habitat what 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 could be the likely and possible repercussions will it affect the the knowledge which they have in this particular uh, geographical setting so these are some of the questions which normally we can you know uh, pose when we discuss this idea of indigenous knowledge now, mostly, uh, so far, if you look globally, um, the indigenous people are spread across the entire uh, world. And uh, ma many studies have been taken into account by the anthropologists, uh, the ecologists, and so on and so forth, in trying to locate maxims of not just the sociocultural practices, but also the idea of knowledge in terms of how they you know manage their natural resources and and the reason why this management of these natural resources of the indigenous people is uh, given uh, of late an important uh, theme or topic of research is mainly because uh, they are seen to be more close to nature and then they have uh, sustainably manage the resources so these are some of the you know uh, ideas or development which is witnessed in the past few decades now according to Silitoy and uh, D. Walt what they have says is the indigenous knowledge conceals the fact that all people irrespective of, of whether they are indigenous to a given area have developed a complicated understanding of the world. So which means with, with the kind of interactions or an experience, different societies uh, develop certain kind of, uh, you know, understanding or maxims uh, of their natural surroundings. So which means, uh, as I have pointed out earlier, like uh, thus indigenous knowledge means only to those people who are termed as indigenous. So Silito and Dewalt in a way have, you know, tries to make our doubts clear by saying that uh, it, it is not necessary the indigenous uh, to a given area. But, but in the general discourse, you know, human tends to have developed some kind of various strands of understanding of how they you know manage their natural resources now uh, the second thing uh, which Ness also pointed out is again indigenous knowledge cannot be you know displaced out of its local context into another one and used for a national or inter international networks or because it is autonomous that is empirical experience only valid uh, as a world in its place of origin by being uh, terming it as octotons it, it means that since it is being originated from that particular place uh, 
it will be only suitable and then relevant in that uh, area. So which means this whole idea of uh, you know transferring or maybe displacing this particular knowledge for various other purpose will be uh, you know not suitable and irrelevant. Now what does Ness uh, tries to make a point here? By, by saying that uh, it, 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 this empirical experience and only valid as a world in its place of origin. In, in some sense, uh, it makes a, a lot of, you know, a valid point here because most of the time, uh, I mean, what, what's happening uh, globally is the trend of how this knowledge of many indigenous people or aborigines are being in a way uh, hijacked or uh, being transferred by many scientists and then uh, these knowledge are not given the uh, rightful recognitions or, or what we known as this so-called patent rights. So this idea of uh, you know transferring this idea, uh, knowledge is something which uh, Ness in a way is uh, not really you know accepting it. Now by saying that uh, octothon is something which is necessary or uh, the origin of its place in a way it talks about the authentic authenticity which means you know to know things from the personal experience in places where they originate and then thus experiencing them in their proper context. So which means uh, the knowledge in a way has to be understood in its context rather than out of its context. So uh, it is important for ones to have a first hand experience of encountering those uh, objects, facts and figures in its original geographical setting. So that enables them to have that sort of personal experience in places where they originate. So therefore, this authentic authenticity is something uh, which is also highly talked about when we discuss uh, the indigenous knowledge with uh, with their original place. Now, Seelen and uh, Smithson uh, also have uh, a different take here. Uh, when they say indigenous means something uh, is originating locally and performed by a community or society in this specified place. So. Uh, even the Seelen and Smithson were like uh, very vocal and then talking about the idea of these octothons or maybe uh, linking with uh, its origin. Therefore, in this knowledge, in a way, emerges as people's perspective and experience in the environment. Uh, it, it, it is not simply based on uh, a mere speculation or perception, but it is also based on experience in an environment at a given time and uh, in a continuous process that is uh, based on observation and interpretation uh, in relation to the locally acknowledged uh, everyday rationalities and transcendental powers. Now over here, this observation and interpretation is something which is uh, given uh, an importance here. Now, why is it important to employ this idea of observation here? Because normally, if you take the examples of uh, the indigenous people, uh, they, they don't really, you know, engage into the formal classroom kind of teaching. Uh, which, which normally we does in academics. For instance, uh, uh, the farming communities, let's say. So the child or 
uh, the children in the family usually uh, observe and tries to learn from the kind of practices the parents and the elders does maybe dibbling or trying to you know uh, uh, engage in certain kinds of activities in the farm so this sort of agriculture practices are not something which is being taught formally to the uh, children but by way of this observ observation they they tend to you know make sense of it and they apply that uh, when they becomes adult or maybe when they becomes you know the rightful age to you know engage in that kind of agricultural activities so therefore it is something which is uh, pretty much uh, you know an experiential kind of base in a particular environment in a given context and and usually in a continuous process so it is not something that you know you set a particular debt and then so how things are being taught so it, it it's not like the kind of farmer trainings which we normally witness in uh, the present day times because uh, those are based on you know uh, more or less confined to the formal way of teaching uh, based in the you know classroom kind of environment so these are rather something which is learned in that particular you know authentic environment it's being experienced and it is a continuous process so this these are some of the ideas which emerges when we talk about the indigenous knowledge of how they make sense of their environment now this the context of this local social performance in a way makes sense between people who uh, normally share a common rural habitat language and knowledge be it esoteric open for old or uh, esoteric that is a sacred knowledge now uh, why is it that uh, the language also becomes important here in terms of, you know, imparting this knowledge or if one tries to make sense of the knowledge. Because it, language that way, as we had also discussed in the uh, previous lectures, how language in a way tends to, you know, indicate certain kinds of embedded meanings. Because... Uh, a language normally which is being understood by an outsiders or maybe uh, from an esoteric viewpoint will be different from how the communities or those who inhabit that particular uh, environment uh, of, of the for example the names they give and th those the names they give to animals and plants will also be sometimes used in the daily discourse of, of trying to you know uh, which, 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 which will be in a way more uh, jargonized in a way. so this idea of uh, language and at the same time the kind of socio-cultural practices uh, which is being shared between people maybe the kind of rhythms and the agriculture uh, ritual cycle so on and so forth is something which also needs to be you know understood I'll come to the agriculture rituals and ceremonies uh, when we talk about the case study among the cookie tribes so for the time being we'll try to uh, sort of uh, to have a much more a fuller understanding of what indigenous knowledge is it will be important to situate and locate by uh, you know differentiating it from uh, what are the sort of uh, nuances between uh, and in this knowledge and I and the knowledge which is in science or the scientific knowledge now Levi Strauss in his savage mind uh, 
he, he tries to look at the uh, knowledge which is being possessed I mean, the, by the native people. So, uh, Levi Strauss coined a term uh, called Brycolites. So, uh, it, it is a French word which also means uh, do it yourself. That is because uh, Levi Strauss was pretty much interested in uh, knowing how societies create this novel solution by using resources that already exist in the collective social consciousness. Now, how does one make sense of, you know, or maybe let's say uh, the development of this ethnoecology, ethnomedicine, so on and so forth. Now, uh, we have also discussed in the previous lectures that by using the uh, prefix ethno, the scientific community are in a way trying to, you know, like bridge the gap or maybe trying to accommodate the idea of these native peoples in the domain of the scientific discourse, like the ethnoecology, ethnomedicine, so on and so forth. Now, what uh, Levi Strauss, in a way, is pretty much enthusiastic in trying to look at how these uh, societies, in a way, uh, are able to or attempts to create these novel solutions by using resources which in a way have been already in existence or pretty much uh, predominant in the collective consciousness which have been witnessed every day. So what could perhaps be the steps involved in that? Uh, maybe for instance, uh, will it be based on the trial and error kind of experience? So, you know, like uh, the native societies might not have or does not have the kind of modern laboratories, laboratory systems. Uh, now, how do they try to experience and uh, test the sort of potentials of maybe a particular plant or carp, shrub, so and so forth. So, these are something which in a way interested uh, Levi Strauss in trying to look at uh, the kind of practical knowledge or solutions which these native societies have. So, the kind of activities that are performed by a handyman, that is <clears throat> the bright collier performs his tasks with materials and tools are at hand from oats and ants grows from the already existent uh, consciousness and resources. Now, Bricolage again is, uh, can be compared to, you know, the uh, performance by a handyman that is trying to uh, use the already available resources, right? And, and, and this task with materials and tools that are at hand, that is, uh, in order to, you know, uh, bring a solution that is the oats and ants. Now, therefore, this uh, scientific and this mythical thought should be in a way understood as valid and that one does not supersede the other, which means they are two autonomous ways of thinking rather than two stages in an evolution of thought. So, in a way, uh, by saying so, Levi Strauss tries to reject the idea that uh, the notion of this evolution or evolutionary ideas of how the mythical thought are, are, are generally termed to be uncivilized. But, but what Strauss tries to point out here is the scientific and mythical thought has to be in a way understood as valid and they have their own autonomous ways of thinking rather than two stages and an evolution of thought. Now, normally, if you look at 
uh, these ideas of how the science or scientific uh, community tries to you know do in a laboratory settings uh, they normally don't use tools uh, which, which are irre irrelevant now for example let's say uh, magic is not a primitive science why because uh, uh, normally uh, magic is something which also have their own autonomous ways of how it operates and, and it is effective as long as the people subscribe or uh, are being guided by this uh, mythical belief or the prevalence of uh, the extraordinary kind of power which exists uh, alongside. Now, usually in this uh, cultural studies that is bricolage is used to mean the process by which people in a way acquire objects from across social divisions to create a new cultural identities. Now, uh, in the description of uh, uh, Levi Strauss, he tries to talk about how it is opposed to the engineer's creative thinking that is the science of the concrete which proceeds from the goals to means. That is, usually a scientist or science of the concrete focuses more on uh, setting a goals and then thereby try different means to achieve or to reach that particular goals. Uh, and on, on the other hand, this mythical thought, according to Strauss, rather attempts to, you know, reuse the available materials in, or, in order to solve new problems. So, which means uh, the kind of, uh, you know, attributes one has, that is, medical thoughts normally uh, tends to, you know, engage in, for example, uh, if, if, if we give the examples of, let's say, the canoe building community, the canoe in a way is usually used for you know transportation but if a particular symbol is being carved at the end of the canoe let's say uh, maybe a skull or any kind of uh, images so as those canoe building communities maybe for example among the Trobrine Trub Islander which, which is studied by Malinowski, talks about how this, uh, the canoe is being built. So, in order to get, uh, you know, defend from the attack of Sirks, normally these communities used to, you know, uh, make certain kind of images and symbols at the end of the canoe. So, which in a way is uh, pretty much uh, instrumental and in, in, in serving their purposes. So, therefore, uh, this idea of uh, the reuse of these available materials uh, to solve their new problems is something which is pretty much different from this idea of science of the concrete, which in a way proceeds from the goals to means. Now, therefore, this idea of uh, the social cultural beliefs and practices has to be understood of how a particular community makes sense or use their resources in terms of uh, what, perp what significant purpose that does it serve to them. Now, the Bricolier again uh, deals in the use of science, whereas the, in the engineer deals in concepts that is terminologies ideas so and so forth now as i was talking about the carving of the images or symbols at the end of the canoe in a way is a part of science so concepts in a way opened possibilities uh, of uh, you know possibilities can be more of uh, inviting critics 
and then there is also a scope for you know improvement and uh, people can reject the ideas and then come up with newer ideas so that sort of possibilities is there while science in a way uh, recycle previously available meanings so so in a way it, it, it to encounter or to solve the new problems it, it tries to you know recycle uh, itself now this particular mythical thought that is the bright collier builds up uh, structures by fitting together events so it tries to you know uh, negotiate and, and understand uh, uh, different sets of uh, you know events by putting them together that is structuring them or rather the remains of events maybe for instance uh, let's say an example of a uh, hunting society so maybe uh, before going for a hunt they perform a particular kind of ritual that is uh, in, in terms of you know praying to the spirit of the animals so that they, they get uh, they are fortunate enough in the game so at the end like when they go for hunting so uh, as a result of that they might be getting uh, a sort of a handsome kind of return so normally those events which which happen separately can be in a way put together and uh, structure so uh, science in a way is operated differently uh, because simply by virtue of coming into being or creates its means and results as i was talking about how uh, the goals are set uh, to means and the form of events so this structure in a way is something uh, which, which constantly elaborate and which are its hypotheses and theories. Now usually uh, uh, in science what we do is uh, form a hypothesis, theorize and then tends to you know uh, 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 looked at the validity and the application of it. But, but rather in the context of this mythical thought that is the Bricolio, they, they simply try to you know, structure the, uh, by, by fitting in those uh, events together. So therefore, uh, there, there's uh, this continuous process of you know, reuse and recycle of the available resources in terms of uh, solving their problems. The scientists in a way also uh, creates events that is changing the world by means of structure while the bricolier on the other hand creates structure by means of events now the, 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 the sort of uh, you know the binaries between uh, the con science of concrete and the bricolier so the bricolier in a way you know uh, makes sense makes a uh, creative use of the resources available at hand it is more of a design approach while the scientist is in a way guided by a theoretical construction so in a way uh, one is pretty much theoretical and the other is practical and uh, it tries to make sense of the resources which is available in that particular natural surroundings now, as, as we have discussed, what then is indigenous knowledge? Indigenous knowledge is, you know, embedded in culture and more than assigns to those who practice it. So, it is not simply uh, a practice, but it is pretty much embedded in culture and uh, for those uh, if science is a, more, a, more, a small part of knowledge, treating in this knowledge as science in a way diminishes its breadth and uh, value. So to equate this in this knowledge as uh, 
the science in a way would uh, you know uh, compromises or diminishes uh, the real meanings at embedded to uh, an indigenous knowledge. You know, science and indigenous knowledge also intersect in certain subject areas such as technology, resource management, ecology, and the classification of these living organisms. Now, uh, therefore, uh, one, one can, you know, try to look at the kind of boundaries, if not uh, the discourse where science and indigenous knowledge in a way uh, overlap and the subject areas in which they can be in a way, you know, uh, contextualized. For example, in technology. On the other hand, we have the science and technology, and on the uh, we also have the indigenous knowledge technology. Then what what then is indigenous technology? So one needs to make sense of how those communities are in a way, you know, practically using uh, maybe the farming activities and so on and so forth. Uh, and in terms of resource management, how uh, you know um, the idea of this biodiversity conservation, so on and so forth, is also strongly you know projected by the modern science. And uh, alongside, we also have the indigenous knowledge, how they have in a way sustainably managed the resources, and what are the uh, ideas behind all this right and and how ecology is being perceived uh, differently and and also the classification of these the living organisms so both science and indigenous knowledge that way intersects uh, in in different kinds of these themes and this ik or indigenous knowledge is usually passed on by informed experience and practical demonstrations, more often shown than articulated, it is as much skill as a concept. So, as I was talking about how uh, it is being learned, that is through observations and interpretations. Therefore, uh, this knowledge is not something uh, which is being learned uh, as a concept or theory but rather it is uh, passed on by informed experience and practical demonstration. And indigenous knowledge is also stored uh, in people's memories and activities and is expressed in stories, songs, folklore, proverb, dance, myths, cultural values, belief, uh, rituals, community laws, local languages and taxonomy, agriculture practices, equipment, materials, plants, species and animal breeds. Now, it, it, it is not something which is being, you know, documented uh, in uh, sort of a classroom or, uh, or which is similar to the formal knowledge. Uh, therefore, this IK is usually stored in memories and activities and which is expressed uh, in a, you know, multiple ways. So, therefore, if we take the examples of, uh, let's say, memory. Now, uh, will it be, you know, uh, feasible if a particular community is being displaced from a particular uh, environment? will they still be in possess of this uh, knowledge because normally those are being stored in their memories and also uh, keeping aside the activities. Now, therefore, with their constant interactions with the environment and uh, their surroundings or maybe with the flora and fauna and then so on and so forth, they have store this knowledge through uh, their memories and activities and, and usually which are being you know uh, learned through experience. It is also uh, 
you know a practi practical common sense which are based on good reasoning and logic built on experience now therefore uh, one needs to understand the indigenous knowledge uh, in that sense how it is being expressed how it is being stored because normally uh, the modern science is interested in you know mostly uh, documenting their knowledge because they feel that uh, you know this knowledge which is orally handed down can in a way vanish after a point so therefore there has been the research which normally focuses on trying to document this indigenous knowledge and I'm, I'm sure uh, in the works of like uh, the P.S. Ramakrishnan, the annotated ecologist, have been extensively working in the Northeast region uh, in the past few decades and also uh, tries to document some of the, you know, shifting cultivators, their knowledge, experience, skills, uh, so and so forth. So, therefore, uh, this idea of no in this knowledge system are in a way uh, uh, which which are cumulative and representing the generations of experiences uh, we, which are based on careful observations and also through the means of these trial and error experiments now uh, to put it in a very simple note because uh, the edible items like vegetables, fruits, so and so forth, even animals for that matter. Now, uh, not every you know vegetables is edible, or not every fruit is you know fit for human consumption, or maybe depending on the kind of taste. So this taste, in a way, is being developed uh, over and over. Uh, I mean, different successive generations. But mind you, uh, the manner in which these uh, edible items were, you know, first uh, discovered, or maybe let's say, you know, from the knowledge of the bricolier, it is being reused to solve their problems, which of course is already an available resources. Now, in that, uh, this idea of you know uh, trial and error experiments were pretty much uh, evident, and then. Uh, uh, which is pretty much seen in the context of this, uh, how these indigenous knowledge systems are being developed. Now, indigenous knowledge, in a way, is also based on the intimate knowledge of the land, uh, water, snow and ice, weather and wildlife, and also the relationship between all aspects of the environment. Now, why is it that this knowledge uh, has to be located in terms of the in intimate knowledge of all this because it, it is not confined to only a specific uh, you know uh, object or perspective it is it is a multi-dimensional understanding of intimate relationship with and and this is how uh, the vastness or the you know indigenous knowledge is being formed now for instance if you look at the you know tribal communities their own engagement and their understanding of landscape their societies of the you know and then their stories of nature and their live histories might in a way reveal that these uh, forest communities uh, history uh, relationship with the landscape have developed into a more sophisticated knowledge of the jungle environment. Now, how? Because uh, these are not something which are being learned overnight or maybe a few months time or a year, but it is a constant engagement and a sort of uh, based on the leaf history. So therefore, maybe their knowledge is pretty much extensive and uh, they are very much well versed with the environment which they are pretty much located. 
So that's how this uh, knowledge uh, is being formed and established. Now, it, it, it is not something that, uh, you know, uh, like the modern days of uh, the urban affluent people, like going to the wild and then, you know, being there for a few days and enjoying the sort of environment or surroundings over there. So, so that, that, that sort of uh, brief visit might not be adequate for someone to, you know, have this sort of uh, form a sophisticated knowledge because it requires, you know, uh, an engagement and their understanding of the landscape. So this would perhaps be possible only if somebody really, you know, makes sense of their uh, natural resource, how they are being managed. And, and it, it, it's not just about simply managing, but it also becomes part of their sociocultural practices. So therefore, it has, a, you know, a multidimensional or uh, in-depth meaning of how one tries to situate and understand. Now, let us try to look at uh, uh, the works of uh, Tim Wingold, another uh, ecological anthrop I mean, anthropologist, uh, in his work called Dwelling Perspective. Now, what does Tim Wingold try to, you know, expose it in his, uh, you know, uh, works over here? Now, he argued what he calls as, uh, you know, a dwelling perspective, that is, a perspective that situates the human being in an active engagement with the constituents of his or her surroundings. That is, uh, in a way, this active engagement is also uh, a segment of that indigenous knowledge. So, one needs to have this active engagement with the constituents of his or her surroundings. So that's, that's perhaps the, you know, the foundation of how in this knowledge is being developed. Now, Ingol's works also concerns uh, mainly the uh, foraging, for, foraging community, that is the people who are engaged in hunting and gathering, and also the pastoral communities, people who are, you know, today often uh, determined, uh, defined as, you know, indigenous people, and here he identifies a common relational understanding of them and their uh, life world. Now, when we talk about uh, understanding of them and their life world, we are also looking at how uh, the way in which um, the so-called cosmology or uh, uh, the manner in which the sociocultural practices, economic, political, so and so forth, everything is being embedded. So one needs to have, uh, you know, a thorough understanding or one needs to identify this common relational understanding of the indigenous people and their life world, how they functioned in, in, in making sense of not just their subsistence, but also beyond. IK, in a way, is shared and uh, communicated uh, orally uh, by specific examples and true culture. So it, it has to have that cultural connotations and it needs to have that sort of you know in-depth meaning which is being attached within that uh, situated within that cultural context. Now indigenous forms of this communication and organizations are uh, also vital to local level decision making processes and to the preservation development and spread of indigenous knowledge. Now, as we also had already discussed that how IK is being, you know, uh, stored in, in not just in people's memory also but in activities. Now, IK is uh, as discussed is transmitted by word of mouth, so it is vulnerable to rapid change, especially when people are being displaced. 
that is maybe through a process of development projects or it can be anything voluntary or involuntary or when young people acquire values and lifestyles different from those of their ancestors so normally uh, as people become much more you know let's say be educated or uh, in a western uh, line they, they, they normally you know tends to you know move away from their early ways of life and uh, as a result uh, uh, that there is a possibility of a repeat change in indigenous knowledge now as i was talking like uh, we also should you know try to uh, look at the differences between this knowledge and the scientific knowledge now agarwal in a way was the uh, perhaps gives a very uh, good uh, differentiation between this IK and scientific knowledge. Now, what he contends is that the critical difference between this indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge lies in their relationship to power and that is not the holders of IK uh, who exercise the power to marginalize. Now, that uh, the holders of this IK who exercise the powers to marginalize. That, that, that is perhaps one of the critical difference. That is, indigenous people have you know, demonstrated through their own use and application of IK and their own survival that their knowledge system are based on sound concepts. Uh, therefore, there is now uh, mounting scientific evidence that IK concepts are sound and this concept should in a way be able to stand up to assessment and evaluation. Now, since the only differences between them is the, you know, in terms of uh, their relationship to power. That is, uh, obviously the uh, people who possess the scientific knowledge you know, usually claims that they are at the upper hand, but but now uh, there's a you know an increasing uh, a, a dramatic turn where uh, the IK also have uh, you know these concepts are considered to be you know adequate in terms of uh, engaging in assessment and evaluations. Now that that is just a quick you know uh, differences between the the IK and scientific knowledge. Now, I would like to, you know, uh, not really delve into the development process as such, but usually when we talk about the indigenous peoples in relationship to development, uh, one, one thing we should remember is the idea of this life project. Then what is life project? Life projects are something which, which are pretty much important for the indigenous people as because uh, this, this hist uh, local histories are embedded and they also encompass a visions of the world that is the future that are distinct from the embodied uh, by projects promoted by state and markets. And also life projects in a way uh, should diverge from development in their attention uh, to the uni uniqueness of people's experience of place and self and the rejections of visions that are you know claimed to be universal thus these life projects are in a way premised in densely uniquely woven threads of landscape memories expectations and desires so as we were talking about indigenous knowledge how their uh, uh, you know knowledge are being stored in memories and activities. So therefore, one needs to know the life, life projects of the indigenous people when somebody is trying to, you know, uh, even talk or think about or initiate any kind of development. Why? Because uh, they, they share a significant relationship with their environment or the land because their 
histories are embodied in it and also they have this uh, landscape as not something which is uh, from the utilitarian perspective but they do have that uh, you know threads of connection which which ultimately becomes a cultural landscape and the memories and expectations and desires so one of the you know uh, some of the con concerns which needs to be examined uh, in connection to this counterpoint is the uh, contrast between indigenous people's life uh, projects as you know which is place-based perspective and uh, on the other hand the universalist visions that justify and save uh, shape uh, development projects now uh, this sort of uh, counterpoints needs to be understood because uh, normally we you know always talk about uh, and any kind of development programs are seen to be you know affecting the indigenous people and then their interests livelihoods are being affected but but one needs to look at the kind of uh, how these life projects of the indigenous peoples are into uh, meant operating now how indigenous people pursue their life projects how this indigenous people pursue their life projects against those uh, development projects being done at the expense in the context of these emerging structures of governance and subordinations. Now, over here we can see the idea of how uh, uh, the kind of development projects which are being initiated and backed by the state uh, are being pursued uh, against the interests of the indigenous people that is which is antithetical to their life projects now therefore these this have uh, you know crop up the idea of how uh, this idea of governance and subordination is being meted out against the indigenous people and then the question arises why is the human their human rights or rights to access to those resources being you know uh, affected by the state-led development projects now how in spite of this indigenous peoples you know their willingness to share land and resources with other users the question is not that they outrightly reject or you know they they don't cooperate or they are not ready to even share their resources but the question is despite their willingness to share the development projects are you know on the on on the one hand not unwilling to recognize and seek to obscure uh, coexistence so there's this denial of this coexistence that is the uh, feeling of this superiority or if not as if uh, you know the development projects led by you know the states are doing something uh, or acting against the interests of the indigenous people because uh, this this whole idea of accommodations or bringing in them in this project is something which is being missed now therefore despite their willingness because many a times uh, the policy makers and planners or development uh, projects practitioners often blame the indigenous peoples for you know not cooperating and then against this idea of uh, development